Hello everybody, welcome back to our virtual classroom and another lesson in our trades training video series. Let's get right into it. Now that we've gone through our nails and our screws, it's important to talk about coatings, platings, and uh, materials that they're made out of. All of this adds to how long that fastener will last. One thing we don't want on our fasteners is corrosion. That ends up uh, with a lot of these steel fasteners. It results in rust. That will be failing fasteners. Uh, in the end, it also doesn't look good when you see a rusted fastener or either a screw or a nail head. And if we're using these outside, we have to consider how corrosion resistant they are. So I'll give you some basic coatings. They might be on screws, they might be on nails, they could be on both. I'm going to start with a cement and a vinyl coating. So I have two fasteners here. They're the same fastener. One has a vinyl coating on it. And this one has a cement coating on it. So your coatings can add to that corrosion resistance or they might give you some other performance value. So this vinyl coated one, this vinyl coating will melt when this nail is driven, the friction causes heat. And for that moment, that vinyl will melt and make this nail go in easier. It acts like a lubricant. The cement coating on this nail, once it's driven, will add to the gripping power of this smooth shank. Remember, a smooth shank does not grip as well as other types of shanks, so anything we can do to help that holding power will make this work better as a connector. Another coating you might see is a phosphate coating. And I, I want you to think about the appearance of coatings because it's very important that we're able to identify these by sight. Once they leave the package, or the container they're in, it's up to us to know what we're using and we use the right one. So this one will always be black. A dull black coating is phosphate. Phosphate is not an exterior uh, finish on a, on a fastener, and you'll find this mostly on screws. So this dull black finish will help us to get this fastener in long enough to, uh, to maybe coat it with drywall mud. You might see a piece of drywall with a uh, drywall screw in it. This is black, so it's phosphate coated. That will provide us enough protection long enough to get it covered, painted, and done. This uh, type of screw or this type of coating should not be used outside. This screw would rust in short order if it was exposed to the elements. So if we need to use this type of general purpose screw or any fastener outside, we need to start coating it with something. This is where a metal called zinc comes in handy. We love zinc because what it does, it allows us to, uh, to protect the steel that's underneath. Most of our fasteners are made of steel. That's where we get our strength. Unfortunately, steel rusts fairly quickly. Zinc uh, will coat the steel and it will not allow it to rust. So I have what's called electroplated zinc on these fasteners. You can also see it on nails. So here we have a nail uh, nails and screws that are zinc electroplated. If you're looking for uh, how to identify this by appearance, you're going to see a shiny, almost blue silver look to it. And these are a very, it's a very thin and it's an electrical process where they plate these with the zinc coating. This offers a certain amount of corrosion protection, not the highest, I would call this sort of your base standard amount of corrosion protection. If you want to bump that up a notch, say you want your zinc electroplate to last a little bit longer, you're going to cadmium plate over your zinc. And that will look like, let's see here, this one. I've got a couple of these. Uh, actually, I have three of them. So the way, the telltale signs for uh, cadmium plating is a sort of a gold look to them. And some of them almost have this uh, sort of a rainbow color effect. You might see some greens and pinks and that kind of thing. Generally a gold look. So what you have here is two layers. You've got your steel fastener with a zinc electroplate, which is your silver, and then the gold on top is the cadmium. What the cadmium does is it hardens the zinc, which is a soft metal. That adds even more corrosion protection to your base zinc. Say you wanted to add even more protection. You start with your zinc, you add your cadmium. The next step would be to epoxy coat these fasteners. So from there, we add a two-part epoxy paint. It's a very hard paint. It will come in different colors. You will not be, identified by, be able to identify it by one single color. 
All of these are epoxy coated. And um, each one of these you can assume has not only the zinc base coat, the electroplate, it also has the cadmium under that. Now you have this triple layer protection. These are one of the better versions of a corrosion protected fastener. Another good way to make a corrosion resistant fastener is to hot dip galvanize it. We talked about our zinc and this is the same zinc that we would use in the electroplating process, but it's done a little differently. So if you see fasteners that have this dull silver to them, it almost, and it, it, it's thicker, it almost looks like paint if you look at it close enough. It has a dull silver to it. Actually, this one's pretty shiny. This is also uh, uh, hot dip galvanized. All of these items have been dipped in molten zinc. This offers a ton of protection. You see a lot of uh, things in marine environments that are hot dip galvanized, even uh, trailers and things that are exposed to a lot of uh, salt water, a lot of high corrosive weather, that kind of thing. What you see here on this fastener, I don't know if you can see this, hopefully I can get a close up of this, but the, the coating is so thick that sometimes it can chip off. So your hot dip galvanized is not probably as well adhered as maybe your zinc electroplate, which is an electrical adhesion process, but the thicker uh, zinc will last a very long time if put on well. You might find that your hot dip galvanized feels almost greasy to the touch. That's sort of a product of the way they have to, to add it or install it on the fastener. But what this means is when you go to drive some of these uh, hot dip galvanized fasteners, your, your, the head of your hammer might tend to slip off of them. People will curse a lot of box nails because they're typically hot dip galvanized and the head is very hard. They're very hard to drive, especially with that thinner shank. Don't forget, you can also hot dip galvanize screws as well. That thing about the sort of greasy feel comes into play. So if you have a Phillips head screw and it's hot dip galvanized, you might struggle to drive that screw. Our best corrosion resistant fastener means that we have to change the material that our fasteners are made out of. If we use stainless steel instead of regular steel to make these fasteners, these fasteners will last almost forever. You find a lot of stainless steel hardware in a marine environment because it's in such a harsh weather conditions a lot of the time. So how do you identify your stainless steel? I will tell you that they will have a, a sort of a medium silver finish to them. And you almost have to have a zinc electroplated item next to it to, to tell the difference. And I don't know if the camera can see that, but there's a lot more blue in the zinc electroplate than there is in the stainless steel. This tends to be a little, uh, maybe a little duller color, but they can also be just as shiny as the zinc plate. These are the best and most expensive fasteners to use. We would not use these for every day. These would be very specific for a specific purpose. And like I said, these uh, would be maybe four or five times more expensive than your standard fasteners. Keep in mind that stainless steel, as great as it is against corrosion or against fighting corrosion, they're not as strong as regular steel fasteners. So we cannot put them in the same place. They don't have the same shear strength. So we can only use them in specific places. So we've talked about a lot of different fasteners here. I don't expect you to have memorized all of these different variations. Honestly, it will take you your entire career to learn about all of the hardware that's available and all of the connectors and fasteners. What you can take away from this is that you can understand these different parts, the head, the shank, the point, whether it's a nail or a screw, and start thinking about where you're using them how you need to use them, the materials you're using them with, and how to do each job successfully by choosing the right fastener. Along these lines of choosing the right fastener and understanding the thickness of materials, let's go through some examples. I've got some mock-ups over here. Here I have a two by material, which is inch and a half, and I've got 7 16 OSB. I wanna fasten my OSB to this base material which is the two by. I've got three different screws here. You can see the lengths of these screws. 
Of course, we have our bugle head, which is going to level out with the top of the OSB. And here I've got a really short screw. Code tells us in a lot of situations we need at least an inch of bite of that screw into our base material. I don't have my inch of bite on this short screw. Here I have a two inch screw, which goes clear through my 7 16 through my inch and a half, and almost comes out the back, or comes out the back just a little bit of this two by. The one in the middle is just perfect. It's the right choice for this particular application. And I get actually just even a little more than that inch a bite into the base material. Keep in mind too, that when you're driving screws, it's often that you don't get a straight or direct perfect alignment of your screw. That will affect the amount of screw that ends up in your base material. So it could be that this two inch screw, if it was not quite going in perfectly straight or perpendicular, could be an okay fastener to use as well. Let's look at another one. If I have two two bys that I want to connect together. Here I have my three inch screw. And as you can see, it's very close to the edge or coming out the back of my base material. So this conversation comes into play. You, you might ask, why does it matter about the screw coming out of the back? Well, there's a couple of reasons here. You don't want to over to put too long of a screw in. You're wasting money. First of all, screws are, you purchase them by the piece or by the pound and there's fewer longer screws per pound so you're wasting money if you use too long of a screw the more important thing though is that whenever we're using fasteners whether it's nails or screws there's always there or the possibility of something being behind what we're working on can be a, a, a risk or a danger that could be something really important like an electrical wire, or it could be a plumbing pipe that's pressurized with water. If we pierce that pipe or that wire unintentionally, we can cause a lot of damage or even hazard to ourself during that process. So it's best that the fastener is contained within the materials that we're working with. Just to point out, here you see that this is a three inch screw. So an inch and a half lives in the top board and an inch and a half will live in the base material. There is a tiny point that might come out of the back of this material. So in a way, an ideal length of screw to connect these two boards together would be a two and a half inch screw. You won't find a two and three quarters inch screw as a normal stock material. So a two and a half would be the next size shorter. My last example is drywall attached to framing. Here I have an inch and five eighths drywall screw and it's typical installation for drywall is you need to sink the head of this a little bit. So that's adding to the amount or depth that that fastener will penetrate our base material. So if I flip this over, you can see the screw that I used, uh, I have plenty of room, even if I sink that screw a little bit in the surface of the drywall, it's not going to come out of the back of that material. If I used a longer screw, say a two inch screw, and I sunk that a little bit, we're going to send that screw through the back of this material. Remember that point's very sharp and anything in the way of that could be a real problem or a hazard. So I tricked you. I have one more example I want to show you. And that's how much I love this stuff. I've got some metal stud framing here. This is an example of a metal to metal connection. You have two very hard thin materials that need to be connected. So what I've used for this connection is a truss head screw. This is a very short screw, has a very wide head, and it sits very flat on the material. We're going to be adding things like drywall to the outside of this in the end, so we don't need a very, we don't need a tall head, it will get in the way. We also don't need a lot of length on our screw. These screws tend to be very short, they have that piercing tip, and that's what's going to connect these two very difficult materials to work with. It's going to hold them together really well. So there you have it. There's your basic knowledge about nails and screws. I hope you take all this information with you when you're building. Consider, pay attention to your screws, learn how to work with each and every one of them, how to identify them, and understand when's the best place to use them. You'll build on this knowledge with everything else you learn. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next lesson.